Oh, what do we do? Cool. So good morning, everyone, and good evening to our speaker, uh, Alice in Taiwan. Uh, so today we are great to have uh, Alice to be joining us and to give us a seminar. So Alice is a Sika Fellow at the Institute of Astronomy at NTHU in Taiwan. Uh, so he works on the astrophysical impacts and observational signature of cosmic rays in galaxy. Alice did his undergrad uh, back in the UK, so he's a British, a native British uh, at, at University of Cambridge. Then he went on to do a MSc in astrophysics at UCL and a PhD at Malas Space Science Laboratory, also UCL in the UK. And his thesis uh, is on hadronic processes of energetic particles in star forming galaxy and high redshift protogalactic environment. So uh, when, when we did our PhD, uh, I have the great pleasure sharing the same office as Alice and hearing talking about his passion of cosmic ray. And it's really, really interesting. So, so today we are going to hear about uh, his work on characterizing the signature of star forming galaxy in the extragalactic gamma ray background. So take it away, Alice. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And thank you to Jennifer and the organizers for arranging this talk so that I can give it at a time that's not too late for me and hopefully not too early for, for you guys as well. Um, so as Jennifer said, I'll be I'll be talking about some of my some of my more recent work on um, the gamma ray signatures of star forming galaxies in the in the extragalactic gamma ray background. Um, so this is in in collaboration with with Keegan Lee um, at IPMU in Tokyo and uh, Albert Kong here at National Tsinghua University in, in Taiwan as well. So I'll, I'll start off. I, I'll start. Oh, I can't change my slide. Okay. I'll start off by showing you this, this picture, which I imagine many of you have, have seen before, um, which is the, the gamma ray sky above 10 GV, um, as seen over 10 years by the Fermilab Space Telescope. Um, so there's a number of uh, interesting features that uh, probably catch your eye on, on first glimpse of this picture. The first, of course, is the uh, giant swathe of gamma ray emission coming from uh, the, uh, from the uh, galactic plane. Um, and then above and below the galactic plane, um, we can see the outlines of the Fermi bubbles here. Um, and then in the distance, we can see these extra galactic point like sources. Unfortunately, in this particular image I, I, I selected, um, they've also highlighted a number of sources in green. But I think my point still stands. There's this these extra galactic resolved point sources as well, which are usually attributed to things like AGN, VLX, uh, blazars, and so on. So the emission from the, the gamma ray plane is, is from a, a range of different processes. Uh, it could be coming from uh, systems like supernova remnants, uh, stellar end products, and there's also some diffuse glow, which is presumably driven by um, hadronic gamma ray emissions leading to uh, neutral pions, and then the decay of those neutral pions is producing some diffuse gamma rays from, from dense, dense clouds as well as the cosmic rays from within our galaxy interact with those. Um, Above and below the the, the galactic plane, these, these Fermi bubbles are very interesting features. Um, like the actual origin and properties of these are still a little unsettled in the community at the moment. There seems to be some movement towards the idea that they might be uh, a previous burst of some kind of AGN activity or something, and we're seeing the remnant of that in the, in the these Fermi bubble-like structures. Um, and these point-like sources have lots of interesting gamma ray features um, and uh, often. Uh, produced and uh, not been identified in various catalogs that are published quite regularly as Fermi is able to resolve more and more of them. And these are all very, very interesting. Um, I, I personally work on the, the gamma ray bubbles as well. Um, sorry, the Fermi bubbles as well, as well as some of these extra galactic point-like sources. But for the next hour or so, uh, kind of bizarrely, I'm going to be all ignoring all of this exciting bright emission and focusing on this, this blue background here. And hopefully I can convince you that there's something that's, that's worth looking into of scientific interest in this background that can tell us something about the um, evolution of galaxies and the, the role of, that cosmic rays could have in, in shaping that evolution during the, the cosmic noon and, and thereafter. So the, the outline of my talk, I'll start off by, by talking about star forming galaxies, why I think they might contribute to the gamma ray sky. Um, how the gamma rays are produced by cosmic rays in those galaxies, um, and how those cosmic rays can drive that high energy emission. Um, I'll then move on to discussing models for like, modeling this gamma ray emission and how this can be 
um, built into a, a, a model of the extragalactic gamma ray background as produced in star forming galaxies. Uh, before taking a few moments to talk about future scope for like using observations to probe gamma rays at work using using the extragalactic gamma ray background. So what is the extragalactic gamma, gamma ray background? Well, it's um, been observed over a broad range of energies now. And it's fairly distinctive in that it doesn't show any particular distinctive features. Um, what we see is, uh, is this diffuse emission um, from outside the galaxy between about 0.1 to about 820 GeV. It's a nice power law up to a, a few hundred GeV or so. And above that, there's detection persisting up to this, this upper range of about 820 GeV with this exponential cutoff. So above 100 GeV or so, about 50% of the emission is now resolved into individual lat sources, Fermi lat sources. And many of these sources are like AGM type environments. Most of them are blazars, BL lacs, and so on. At lower energies, there's a little bit more flexibility. Like a lot is still coming from this, these AGM type environments, but actually things like star forming galaxies could contribute up to a few tens of percent, particularly up to a PEV or so, particularly in this region. So why do people think that star forming galaxies might be potential sources? Um, well, because they've been detecting gamma rays in the local universe. So let me introduce a few star forming galaxies to you. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of what a star forming galaxy is. And if we look into the uh, examples in, in our local universities, are three prototypical systems that often crop up in the literature, NGC 253, ARP220, and M82. And of course, as the name would suggest, they have a, a relatively elevated rate of star formation compared to the Milky Way. So that star forming active G rapidly leads to the emergence of supernova events. Um, and as a result, uh, the, the supernova rate of these systems would also be elevated compared to the Milky Way. Um, and I mention that because actually I'll later show that the, the, the supernova remnant abundance can actually be quite a useful parameter to understand the injection of cosmic rays and the abundance of cosmic rays in these environments. So as I alluded to just a few moments ago, uh, these galaxies have all been detected in gamma rays. They are not the only nearby star forming galaxies now to have been detected by gamma rays. Last year there was a work by Agello um, et al, which I think listed at 12, 13 or 14, I can't remember the exact number, but a number of uh, nearby star forming galaxies uh, detected as bright gamma ray sources in the, in the extra galactic sky. Um, and the number is increasing all of the time as Fermi is increasing its integration time. Um, so we see actually in, in the case of M82, some of these gamma rays can reach relatively high energies up to a few hundred GeV. Um, and there's, these are very uh, clearly, resolved, clearly resolved blobs of gamma rays and that are co-spatial with these three star forming galaxies. So that's generally the initial motivation for people to start thinking about why, about uh, star forming galaxies as a potential contributor to the extragalactic gamma ray background, because of course, over, over cosmic time, many star forming galaxies would exist in the universe, particularly at uh, higher redshifts around the cosmic noon. And potentially, if there's lots of them, they could produce a diffuse, unresolved uh, gamma ray flux that we're not able to detect as point sources, but is contributing to an unresolved background component of the, of the gamma ray background. So, OK, that's all very well. But why, why would it be important to study the gamma ray emission from star forming galaxies on these cosmological scales? Well, personally, I'm interested in things like galaxy formation and evolution. And from a galaxy evolution perspective, the star forming galaxy contribution to the back gamma ray background is interesting because not only are this, is this gamma ray emission tracing the presence of cosmic rays, it's actually tracing the cosmic ray interactions in these star forming galaxies. And if we can do that, we can begin to identify the role that cosmic rays may have um, and their potential as an important agent to control and mediate the evolution of star forming galaxies. So if we can potentially resolve or at least probe the emission of gamma rays, even if the galaxies themselves are not resolved from uh, star forming galaxies over cosmic time, we can start to get a handle on what kind of role cosmic rays might be playing and how important that role might, might be in the evolution of star forming galaxies. So I mentioned this, like this engagement of, of cosmic rays in galaxies before. Um, and I, I just want to firstly 
outline why cosmic rays are uh, likely to be um, abundant in star forming galaxies. Um, and then I'll talk about what they can do in these kinds of systems. So the, uh, the we can identify certain sources of, of, of cosmic rays actually just using using high school physics. Um, so if we were to take a, a uniform magnetic field, um, a charged particle traveling through that would describe uh, a, a curved path. And the radius of that curve, the radius of curvature of that path would, would be larger for a more energetic particle, um, or would be smaller in a stronger magnetic field. So we could think of an environment of accelerating cosmic rays in some way. Uh, we could argue that for the cosmic rays to continue to be accelerated, these charged particles could continue to be accelerated, but they must somehow be contained within the system that's accelerating them. Um, so we could compare the gyro radius, the Lama radius of the cosmic ray, that the radius of curvature of that curved path the cosmic rays are, are, are describing in, in their magnetic field with the size of the, the accelerating system. And once that, that radius of curvature is, is larger than the size of the system, we could argue that a large fraction or an increasingly large fraction of the cosmic rays are not able to be contained in that system anymore. So this has two implications. Firstly, it sets an indicative characteristic maximum energy that a system can accelerate the cosmic rays to. And secondly, it suggests that as the energy of the cosmic rays is increasing, the escape fraction of cosmic rays from that cosmic accelerator is also increasing. And this leads to a distinctive power loss spectrum in the, in the cosmic ray emission from the accelerator, um, if assuming some kind of Fermi second order acceleration process. That's kind of a side point. But the main point I want to make here is that the we, using this, this criterion of uh, size of system compared to the gyro radius. This is called the Hillis criterion. We can identify certain sources that could accelerate cosmic rays, and we can identify the energy to which the cosmic rays could be accelerated in those systems. Um, so we can look at things like IGM shocks. These are not particularly strongly magnetized, but their spatial scale is very large. So they're able to accelerate cosmic rays over large distances, and as such, are able to reach very high energies up to about 10 to the 20 electron volts. Um, we also look at sort of more compact systems. So these are these are not very spatially large. Things like neutron stars or stellar emperors, where the magnetic fields are much stronger. Um, so similarly, high energies could be reached, 10 to the 15 to 10 to the 20 electron volts. Um, so if we do consider um, like a star forming galaxy, we can start to identify possible environments that could accelerate cosmic rays. Um, so things like IGM shocks, of course, are much larger than the, than the interior of a star forming galaxy, so we don't need to consider those. We're not thinking about things like AGM, so we don't consider these kinds of environments. GRBs, yes, sure, they could be, they could be there, but they're not going to be very frequent compared to things like supernova, re supernova events. So it turns out that supernova remnants are actually very good cosmic accelerators and should be present in star forming galaxies um, with, with relatively high abundance. So this is where the idea that the cosmic ray energy density or the number of cosmic rays in a star forming galaxy um, is inextricably linked to the um, underlying supernova rate within that galaxy. And that can be related to the star formation rate of the galaxy. So there's a, a, an argument that could be made that the star formation rate of a galaxy can be used to parameterize the cosmic rays contained within, within that host system. So what could those cosmic rays do? Um, well, cosmic ray feedback, feedback, I put it in inverted commas, could have a, a number of different different implications for their host system. And it can operate in a number of a number of different ways. And I like to um, characterize this in a very hand wavy fashion as either thermal, thermal type feedback or dynamical type feedback. And I'm sure many people would argue with this categorization, and I would say it's not a very strong categorization at all. Um, but if we, if we, if I, if I just want to introduce these briefly, we could have some kind of thermal feedback, which is where the cosmic rays interact in some way to heat something up. That thermal pressure then does something or stops something happening. So this could be where cosmic rays are engaging with, um, are interacting with dense regions of the ISM of their host galaxy. This is potentially leading to the deposition of energy. This energy is, is heating up the ambient gases and, and maybe having some implication for the ongoing ability of that local region to form stars. Alternatively, we could have like what I tentatively would describe as dynamical type feedback, which is where the cosmic ray pressure gradient does something to move gases or disrupt existing flows. So if we look at this nice, beautiful picture from Tomlinson, 
Gallup's uh, nice review paper from 2017, you can see that within a within a Gallup, a star forming Gallup peak ticket, a high redshift, um, we can have gas being accreted from the um, certain galactic medium or even even further afield, um, and we can have these outflows of gases as well. So these inflows of gases could be driving the star formation. They can be disrupted by the um, cosmic ray pressure or the momentum being deposited by the cosmic rays, while the outflows could actually be driven either fully or in part by the, the cosmic rays. So I'll give you a few slightly more detailed examples here. Um, so one, one impact of cosmic rays within a galaxy that I looked into recently was their ability to heat and ionize molecular clouds, which could then have some implication for star formation. So we can look at a molecular cloud as um, a very simplified system of a diffuse cloud, a hierarchical system of diffuse cloud with a, a denser inter, inter clump medium within that, which is typically a filamentary structure. And then within that filamentary stu structure, there's these dense clumps and cores. And the actual star formation process would happen in the densest region of some of these cores. Now, if we have cosmic rays propagating in from the interstellar medium and we solve the transport equation, look at the interactions that could arise, which could be MHD scattering, which then thermalizes to heat up the ambient medium, which could be ionization processes and the released electrons and ultimately thermalizing the ambient medium. We can then balance the resulting heating effect against like the cooling effects, cooling processes that would be at work in these dense environments to estimate an equilibrium temperature if cosmic ray processes are assumed to be dominant. And if you have a very intensely star-forming galaxy like R220, you can show that this can substantially raise the temperature of these dense clouds. It might not be enough to stop star formation, but it could be enough to modify the genes mass within these regions, which could change the mode of star formation that proceeds in these star-forming galaxies. Um, so this uh, relates to some work that was recently done by Dallas uh, Papadopoulos, which looked at the different modes of star formation um, in star forming galaxies where cosmic rays change the initial condition of star formation. And actually he argued that if the cosmic ray energy is about, I think five times out of the Milky Way, it seems to lead to the host galaxy favoring a, a top heavy initial mass function for subsequent stars that form. Anyway, if you're interested in this, I'm not gonna talk about it anymore in the rest of this talk, but, but please do check out my recent paper. Thanks uh, to Jennifer for giving me the idea of putting QR codes into my talk so people can more easily access it. So do check that out if you want to um, look at the sort of subgrid scale implications that cosmic rays might have within a galaxy. So then moving on to this dynamical, um, I, I put it in inverted commas again, dynamical uh, feedback of cosmic rays. Um, they can also do things like drive or modify galactic outflows. Uh, so these are some results I, that, I worked on with uh, Brian Yu at UCL a couple of uh, a year ago or so, where we looked at the um, role that cosmic rays could have in modifying the, the, the structure of a, of a galactic outflow. It was a very simple model. Um, we just wanted to assess how the velocity structure, density profile, extent of the outflow, outflow would, would vary if you change the fraction of energy that's being chucked into the cosmic ray component compared to the thermal gas component or radiation component, for example. Um, and one conclusion of this, which was uh, actually also shown by a few other, other papers, in particular Jacob et al. 2018 and Gerichidis et al. 2018, was that not only do cosmic ray dominated flows tend to have slightly lower um, outflow velocities, their densities also tend to be lower than uh, sort of more conventional flows, thermally driven flows, their temperatures tend to be lower. And although it can't be seen very clearly in these plots, their extent can be substantially greater as well. Um, it could reach up to a few tens, maybe even 50 kiloparsecs, so really reaching deep into the seven galactic medium. So again, if you if you want to check out some more details with this work, um, you can follow this this QR code or check out the archive link here, um, and the, the model is explained in a little bit more detail. Um, so much more impressive simulations were were also done. This is not this is not my work, but this is work that appeared earlier this year by um, Phil Hopkins Group where they looked at the potential role that cosmic rays could have in modifying flows in and around galaxies. Um, so here they, they took some initial conditions basically from the fire tube simulations. And they um, these are basically zoom simulations where they took the uh, fire tube, some halos of the fire tube simulations and printed some physics, um, MHD physics onto that, uh, and then uh, injected some energy according to some uh, 
estimated star formation rate in the central galaxy and disk, and then decided to, and then and then saw what happened. So in the case of normal MHD, what they found was um, what happens is after I think uh, I think so, I can't remember what how long how long this had been left to evolve, but for much of the evolution of the of the halo, may, uh, inflows are dominating. So these blue lines are denoting inflow and gas. Uh, so this is the normal MHD situation. Once cosmic rays are added into the mix, and for cosmic rays, they included the pressure imparted by the cosmic rays and also the heating uh, caused by the cosmic rays. So when the cosmic rays were taken into consideration, the picture completely changed. So same initial conditions, same rate of energy injection. What happens is, is a cosmic ray driven outflow emerges. And this outflow has a very large volume filling, fra filling fraction, um, and it reaches very large extents as well. And not only that, it substantially disrupts the flows of gas going into the galaxy, reducing the amount of gas supplying to the, so being supplied to the host galaxy to maintain the ongoing star formation. Um, so this is showing maybe a little clearer um, in, in this plot. This is galactocentric radius um, versus flow velocity. Again, Phil Hopkins working on my own. Um, and in, in blue, we can see the uh, situation with cosmic rays and read the situation without cosmic rays considered in the physics of the of the simulation. Um, so in red you can see that the inflowing gas dominates uh, compared to the outflowing gas. Uh, but when cosmic rays are considered, the picture is completely reversed with outflows becoming much more important than inflows. Um, and of course this affects the, the the subsequent evolution of the galaxy and its its astrophysical properties. So they also looked at the star formation rate that resulted in these two cases, and they could show that the, the inclusion of cosmic rays not only reduced the star formation, but it also moderated it, making it less bursty. So I think like there's a lot of like there's increasing amounts of uh, theoretical evidence that cosmic rays could um, substantially modify the properties of their host galaxy and have some implications for their ongoing evolution. I hope I convinced you that as a result, it's worth looking into these in, in situations where in, in galaxies where cosmic rays uh, are likely to be abundant. So with that in mind, I think uh, I would argue the cosmic noon is probably an ideal test bed to investigate the impacts that the cosmic rays could have on galaxy evolution, because not only do you have, you know, you have the, these high energy, uh, sorry, these high rates of star formation, which lead to high supernova event rates in Star form, in star forming galaxies during this epoch, um, even higher than we might expect in the, in the present universe, and that should lead to abundant cosmic ray, uh, cosmic rays, which could substantially affect the evolution of these systems. So this leads us to the question: How to probe cosmic rays and their impacts in the most direct way possible? Of course, there's many ways to look at the observation implications of the cosmic rays through their impacts on astrochemistry. If we're looking in the local universe, or could even use radio synchrotron emission, but there's certain uh, complications with these effects. So we have to either assume a lot of astrochemical processes. In the case of radio emission, we have to assume a lot about the uh, magnetic field of the host galaxy. So really what we want is something that can very directly probe cosmic ray interactions themselves within the galaxy, which brings me to gamma ray emission. So I mentioned very briefly in, in first slide um, where I showed that huge swathe of gamma ray diffuse emission coming from the plane of our own galaxy. I, I mentioned that some of this could be coming from uh, pion decays. So this is a process where a hadronic cosmic ray, high energy cosmic ray interacts with a, a lower energy uh, proton which could be in the nucleus of a, of a hydrogen atom or something in, in interstellar gas. And this, this leads to the production of these uh, delta resonance baryons which then go on to decay into charged and neutral pions. Now the, the charged pions can decay into, into muons, neutrinos, electrons, positrons, antineutrinos and so on. But it's these, these excuse me, these neutral pions that can um, actually decay into the gamma rays. And this would be the process that could that is excuse me, presumably driving the gamma ray emission, the diffuse gamma ray emission from parts of the, the galactic plane of our own galaxy and also would presumably be operating in more more abundantly star forming galaxies as well um, and could actually offer a quite convenient and a relatively direct probe of not only the presence of cosmic rays but where cosmic rays are actually interacting and engaging with their host environment 
So if we can model the, the gamma ray emission from a star forming galaxy, um, well, actually, we can do this fairly, fairly easily. If we can make some assumption about the underlying density field of the galaxy, all we need to know is a, a rough estimate for the, the gas properties, its density, its, its uh, clumpiness, and so on. Um, the cross section is, is relatively well constrained from, from lab experiments on Earth for the production of gamma rays uh, through this process. Um, and it's fairly independent of energy. So actually, we can model the gamma ray emission from a star forming galaxy fairly well. The next question is how to deal with the gamma ray emission that actually emerges from a galaxy. So the intrinsic gamma ray emission is not necessarily the emission spectrum we might see that's emerging from a star forming galaxy. And the reason for this is there's certain attenuative processes we need to bear in mind. Uh, the most important one, of course, being pair production. So this is where our high energy gamma ray photons will engage with a, interact with a low energy uh, photon that could be provided by the CMB, or more likely it could be provided by the stars or even uh, dust reprocessed starlight. And this leads to the production of electron positron pairs. And within the high density conditions of an interstellar medium of a galaxy, these would typically thermalize, diffuse and eventually thermalize over a distance of about 0.1 kiloparsecs. So this, this energy is effectively lost from the gamma rays. Of course, the amount of energy in, in the gamma rays that's being thermalized into the ISM doesn't have any particular like astrophysical implications. But my, my point here is that in these high density conditions, this process truly attenuates the gamma rays. They're not, they're not re being reprocessed or anything. They're not getting out of the galaxy if they're being attenuated through this channel. In low density conditions, the picture is, is rather different, and I will talk about that uh, in a few minutes. So we can model the attenuation of the gamma rays within their, their host galaxy uh, using a characteristic um, energy loss path length. So this is the characteristic length scale over which a gamma ray would lose energy of order itself, uh, given its interactions with ambient radiation fields. So that could be interaction with starlight, it could be interaction with the CMB, or it could be dust reprocessed starlight. Uh, so in this case, I've calculated the lines assuming a model uh, at conditions at redshift 2 and, uh, and uh, modeling the starlight CMB and dust reprocessed starlight as, as, as black bodies. So we, this would effectively modify this, this effective attenuation process would actually modify the emitted spectrum from a, a star forming galaxy. And we can see this, uh, this this dust attenuation process is actually very, 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 very substantial and can lead to a strong attenuation of gamma rays above about 10 to the 4 GeV, so strongly affecting the spectrum that might be emitted from a star forming galaxy. And we can make a prototype model to uh, uh, roughly characterize what the spectral emissivity of gamma rays might look like from a star forming galaxy as the one I described. So again, the conditions at redshift 2, star formation rates of about 10 solar masses per year, so not even intensely star forming necessarily compared to some examples. We can see there's some attenuation. So, um, so, okay, so here I'm showing uh, in grey the emitted spectrum with no attenuation. So the intrinsic emitted spectrum from the Cosmic, cosmic rays undergoing these hydronic interactions to produce neutral pions, which then decay to produce gamma rays. These are the gamma rays produced directly. And then in black is the uh, post attenuation spectrum. So what would, act, what would actually get out of the galaxy after the uh, gamma gamma pair production process has uh, mopped up some of the gamma rays. So you can actually characterize this spectrum with just a small number of parameters. So its normalization is, is basically completely determined by the cosmic ray energy density. As the cosmic rays are like, if you think about this as a, you could think about this as something, some analog analogous chemical reaction or something. Um, so in, in that case, the cosmic rays would be the rate determ the rate limiting reagent or something like that. Um, the ambient gas is present in excess. In this case, uh, so the cosmic rays are setting the normalization of the spectrum, they're setting the energy budget for the gamma rays. And that can be parameterized in terms of the star formation or the supernova event rate. The spectrum of the gamma rays can be determined actually by an assumed spectrum for the underlying cosmic ray spectrum. Um, and that's because the energy dependence of the uh, PP interaction cross-section is, is relatively weak. 
Um, so actually we can use observations from local star forming galaxies to infer the cosmic ray spectrum in those and then assume something in that range is appropriate for a prototype model um, in the more distant universe. And then in terms of the attenuation processes, we can see the interactions in starlight are causing a little bit of attenuation at intermediate energies. And then the interaction of the dust week process starlight is mopping up all of the gamma rays at, at high energies. Um, so we can clearly mod uh, model the, the cosmic ray underlying spectrum with just a couple of crucial parameters. But actually, we can also model the attenuation due to the starlight using just a few parameters as well if you model it as a black body. Um, so in terms of cosmic rays, we have the spectral normalization of spectral index that's set by the star formation rate and cosmic ray spectral index. And the radiation is determined by their properties of the, the radiation field, so CMB, stellar or, or dust free emitted radiation. CMB is completely determined by the redshift. The stars are determined by the assumed stellar temperature, the characteristic size of the emitting region because it's a diluted black body, um, and the luminosity of the star for the, 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 um, the stars, which can be related to the star formation rate. Again, the dust is very similar to the stars, like it's depending on the, the dust temperature size of the region and the, the dust luminosity, which is the luminosity of the dust we process starlight, which is going to be completely governed by the starlight luminosity itself and in turn um, set by the star formation rate and the dust fraction of the galaxy. So with just a few parameters, we can get a fairly reasonable, physically motivated prototype model for the emission of the gamma rays from a star forming galaxy. And arguably, we could integrate over some population of, of, of star forming galaxies um, over some redshift domain, and then compute what the gamma ray background look like, looks like at redshift zero from doing that. Um, but before, before we can do that, there, there's one other consideration we need to make, and that is some complications in the cosmological propagation of gamma rays. So I showed you this slide just a few moments ago, which was where I argued that in high density high density conditions within the interstellar medium of the star forming galaxy, um, the gamma rays that go through this pair production process get absorbed. And then I made some postponing comment about the low density conditions in the intergalactic medium and argued it's probably a little bit different. So it turns out that actually in these low density conditions, um, the, uh, the produced electron positron pairs will typically undergo an inverse Compton um, uh, scattering with ambient radiation fields, mainly the CMB. And this leads to the production of secondary gamma ray photons as well. Um, so these secondary gamma rays can then be reattenuate can then be reattenuated in ambient radiation fields um, to produce more electron positron pairs, which can then undergo more scattering until the pro and the process continues and continues and continues as, as a cascade until you until the gamma rays are of sufficiently low energy for the pair production process to not happen at a significant rate. But what are the attenuation? What what are the attenuating radiation fields that are initiating this process in the first place? Actually, they're not all that different from the attenuating radiation fields within the uh, galaxy of origin of these gamma rays. There's something called the extrafractic background light, and this is comprised of again the star uh, emission from stars and the reprocessed emission from stuff from dust. So this is the uh, the basically the emission from astrophysical sources that is that originates within galaxies that permeates the extragalactic extra light. And there's a few approaches that can be used to, to model this. Uh, three, in fact, are typically used. Um, so EBL modeling um, has a number of uncertainties associated with it because we don't know exactly what all of the stars and galaxies in the universe look like to infinite redshifts. Um, but we can get a pretty good idea as to what it might look like and how it might evolve and what implications that might have for gamma ray propagation. So typically three approaches are taken. One of three approaches are taken. First is uh, forward evolutionary models where you involve the spectral energy distribution of stellar populations with cosmic star formation history. Uh, backward evolutionary models where you start with the observed proper properties of galaxies in the local universe and then extrapolate backwards in time, uh, often using fairly simple parameterized models, but some more recent attempts are a little bit more um, sophisticated. Or you can use a semi-analytic modeling approach, which is where you take uh, hierarchical models or simulations of galaxy formation and you paint on parameterized models of, uh, of um, 
emission from galaxies within within that simulated simulated universe to estimate the resulting um, EBL. And there's certain advantages and disadvantages associated with each of these approaches. Um, so in terms of the, the 4D evolutionary models, there, there's going to be larger uncertainties at, at lower redshifts. In terms of backward evolution models, it's the, the opposite way around. There's higher uncertainties at higher redshifts. And with semi-analytic models, there's going to be a number of intrinsic uncertainties in the, the models and parameterizations that are adopted. Um, and, and people will typically pick the one that's most appropriate for their science case. Um, so if you're interested in, in very low redshift gamma ray, extra black gamma ray sources, you, you might pick uh, a backward evolution model for your EBL. In this case, I'm interested in emission from all star forming galaxies over a range of redshifts up to about redshift three. So I'm covering the, the cosmic mean. Um, so it seems that a semi-analytic approach would be most appropriate. Um, so in the, in the literature, actually, there's a, a number of semi-analytic and various other approaches that have been taken, and they're all more or less consistent with one another with, within, within allowed errors and uncertainties. Um, and they all show the, the same distinct features. So um, we have these longer wavelengths associated with the dust emission in the EBL, and these higher wavelengths, which is arguably something to do with the emission from the stars within, it, within galaxies throughout the universe. Um, the exact model you, you pick uh, doesn't really matter too much. The, the effects on resulting uh, spectrum, spectra and so on are, are more or less the same with, a, with an uncertainty factor of about three, which is not too bad for these kind of studies, I guess. Um, in, in my case, I adopted uh, the model by Inoue et al. 2013. Um, the reason being simply because the, the model was provided in quite a convenient format um, that interfaced with my own calculations and code ra rather well. Um, but I tried out with a few, a few um, uh, rough. I did a few rough calculations with other models as well, and the results were more or less consistent. It's not the biggest source of uncertainty in my models. Um, so how to build all this together? How to build the EBL together with the internal uh, emission from uh, from galaxies? How to build this into um, how to build this into a, a transfer model to calculate the gamma ray backgrounds at redshift zero? Uh, well, we can take a radiative transfer approach. So um, as, as normal radiative transfer goes, we have an absorption coefficient. We can define this by integrating over the target radiation field, uh, in this case with an energy average cross section. Um, and actually, we can integrate this over a propagation distance as well to compute an effective gamma ray optical depth of the universe. Um, so uh, for, for my work, the, the panels of interest are basically the, the top four here. Um, so low, lower to sort of redshift, uh, low, re low redshift to redshift three or so. Um, and you can see uh, that at low redshift um, and low energies, um, the, the um, intergalactic medium is relatively transparent to gamma rays. But at high redshifts, even down to relatively low energies of gamma rays, there's substantial absorption and the universe becomes optically thick um, just a few tens of GeV. So this shows that gamma ray attenuation and the subsequent reprocessing of those gamma rays by the electron positron pair and inverse Compton cascade process is actually potentially quite important and could modify the emitted spectrum from a population of star from galaxies quite substantially. So it, it must be taken into account. Um, and we can put this all together into, into a cosmological radiative transfer formalism where alpha is our absorption pair, pair production process in EBL radiation fields. Uh, J is our emission function, which accounts for both the cascade free emission and also the fresh star forming galaxy emission at a given redshift as well. So adding both of those together. Um, the cascade free emission, of course, is linked inextricably to the um, absorption coefficient as well. So to self-consistently do this, we need to link this term with this term, but that's certainly doable. Um, and then you can pick your favorite cosmological model to uh, define this term here uh, and then integrate it to compute the gamma ray background at, at redshift zero. And I'll show you, show you this. This is from uh, our recent paper, um, which shows the gamma ray background I computed by adopt a star formation rate function of galaxies and redshift distribution um, uh, derived from the Eagle simulations. Um, 
model I used was adopted from Katsianis et al. 2017. Um, but this 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 shows that that my approach is is consistent with some models. More important, most importantly, is consistent with the constraint imparted by um, uh, Fermi blazars. And uh, so, if you calculate the gamma ray background, re remove the point source, uh, remove the uh, resolved blazars, the emission from the projected EGV from star forming galaxies is still less than that. Um, so my model here, so my model is line one, um, which is the total gamma ray emission. Line two is the gamma ray emission if we neglect the, the cascade process, if we just account for the absorption but not the secondary re-emission. So this is like the direct emission from the star forming galaxies. Um, and you can see here that actually a substantial fraction of the flux is contributed in my model by this cascade process. Um, and that, that flux fraction, as would be expected, is more important lower energies than higher energies. Um, so, uh, so my model is fairly consistent with some, some other recent models in the literature. So Peretti et al. 2020 was almost identical in this energy range, uh, 1 to 10 G, GeV, um, despite adopting quite a different approach. Um, their cascade fraction was substantially lower than mine. Um, it's unclear whether mine is an overestimate or theirs is an under, underestimate or uh, whether the correct value is somewhere in between, in between. And this will be very uncertain for many years to come until the constraints on the EVEL are vastly improved through um, JWST observations or so on, um, so that we can better get a better handle on what the, the true cascade emission should look like. There's also some uh, some substantial range of you know physically, physically plausible gamma ray background models and star forming galaxies as well. Um, so Chakraborty 2013 considered a slightly steeper cosmic ray spectral index within galaxies, um, whereas Makaya et al. 2011 used a slightly different um, source underlying source function for these uh, star formation rate function for their, their sorry for their source distribution. Um, a notable difference I should just probably comment on actually is the is the uh, discrepancy at low energies and this is because many other models consider the inverse Compton emission in low energy gamma rays from uh, star forming galaxies and this can be important uh, but in this work I was actually mainly interested in the 1 to 10 GeV energy range which is why I didn't include the inverse Compton in my, in my own model. <clears throat> so I show you this firstly to, to show that my model is not completely crazy and making bizarre predictions um, but also is like the the, the first observable we can get from uh, populations of star forming galaxies. But actually, we can't extract all that much information from this. We can maybe say something about the underlying star formation rate distribution. We can maybe say something about the total amount of cosmic um, star formation that is dry, um, ultimately driving this gamma ray emission. And maybe we can say something about the intervening um, extra galactic background light radiation fields. But we can't really constrain, use this as a, a model that can later be used to impart constraints on, on galaxy populations or cosmic reactivity therein. But maybe we can look at other kinds of signatures. So one, one signature we could, we could consider is the uh, spatial anisotropy of the gamma ray background. And the reason, the reason I would suggest this is because um, we can consider what the distribution of, of, of star forming galaxies is like from the universe. Um, so from cosmological models and, and various observations now, we know that the um, matter power spectrum of the universe is this distinctive uh, peaked function in, in co-moving wave number. If we translate this to physical space, this has a redshift dependence. So that would suggest that with some bias, star forming galaxies um, have a preferred uh, separation scale um, this is a preferred clustering scale um, that is de dependent on the redshift. On top of that, we could argue that maybe the redshift distribution of star forming galaxies traces roughly the uh, star formation density of the, of the universe. So would perhaps in, in, in some populations of star forming galaxies peak at around redshift two or three. Um, so that would suggest that actually there's a preferred scale at which a lot of the gamma ray emission from star forming galaxies is imprinted into the gamma ray sky. App. And we should be able to discern that scale and also, and also um, extract some information about the, the source distribution in redshift from those star forming galaxies, given that um, at a slightly different epoch, the 
uh, intensity will be a little bit a little bit lower as determined by the redshift distribution of the sources and that that imprinted scale will be slightly different compared to the peak and so on so we should be able to extract some kind of distinctive signature imprinted by the underlying redshift distribution or other properties of the of the source population of star forming galaxies so how would we model an observable um, well we could start from uh, take we could start from modeling uh, a power spectrum for the isotopies in the gamma ray background so we can start from the two point correlation function and we can take the intensity distribution across the sky set directly by the source model so um, if we include this directly in the in the uh, uh, in the um, source distribution model i can avoid having to do all sorts of monte carlo simulations and compute this statistic predict this statistic from my model very directly uh, which is actually computationally not too expensive which allows many different parameterization parameter values to be explored um, so then we can take the Fourier transform of this to get the power spectrum around isotopies, and this can actually be broken down into a clustering and a, and a Poisson term. Um, so for a population like star forming galaxies, we expect a lot of the gamma ray emission to be coming from these star forming galaxies, which are relatively dim gamma ray sources compared to things like AGN or whatever, um, and not particular resolved, but there's a lot of them. Um, so the Poisson noise term should be relatively low. Uh, which should make it slightly easier to extract any, any cross-correlation or clustering term. And putting this into my model and um, seeing what things look like in, indeed does, does uh, support that. So we can see here, this is the Poisson term about three orders of magnitude lower than the, 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 the clustering term. And we can see a clear uh, signature emerging due to the preferred scale of the signatures being imprinted into this and also the associated redshift distribution of the sources. Um, so I've included some, some error bars here, which just give a, a rough idea of the, the uncertainty that might be expected given that the flux is uh, projected to redshift zero in my model and the associated counts that would be um, resulting from that. Um, so here we've got multipole um, and essentially we're splitting up the sky into many different multipoles at large scales. There's not so many, so there's going to be more press on. Uh, so there's going to be more statistical, uh, sorry, more Poisson fluctuations um, because we're integrating it, we're including fewer, fewer bins in that, in that count, so the error bars are larger. But conveniently, around the scales of interest, the error bars are relatively small, so the one sigma statistical errors aren't, aren't going to be messing up our ability to um, extract signals too substantially in the, in the scales of interest. Um, so just as a, as a proof of concept, appreciate time is running a little low. Um, we can explore uh, the variation of certain properties of the, of the source population to, to try and get a feel for what kind of signatures or modification of signatures they can lead to in the underlying anisotropy sig signal. So these are all computed in the 1 to 10 GeV band. Um, there's not a strong energy dependence with any of these results. Um, and what we can see is there's uh, so here I'm, what I'm doing, I'm changing the spectral index assumed for the, the prototype model that's being printed onto the whole, whole galaxy populations. Um, and I'm making it so that the baseline case is an index of about 2.1, which is the average index for uh, star forming galaxies seen in, in the nearby universe. Um, but also considering a, a lower value of minus 1.9 and a, and a steeper value of minus 2.3 which reflects the range of values we're seeing in, in star forming galaxies in the, excuse me, in the local universe as well. So in the top panel, this is, this is just looking directly at the anisotropy signature. And we can see there's a, a difference in flux um, that, that's arriving at redshift zero. Uh, and this is not too, too interesting to me. This is, this is may, maybe unphysical um, just due to the way I've set up the, um, the uh, cosmic ray injection model. Um, so making it a little bit less steeper uh, pushes energies to dip. Uh, so if we make it steeper, sorry, then um, we're putting more energies into the lower, the lower part of the spectrum. Um, and then the gamma rays at that lower end of the spectrum are not attenuated as strongly by that, that dust emission. Um, whereas if the, if the spectrum is less steep, then there's going to be more dust emission. So we're lowering the total flux. So there's nothing too surprising there. Um, 
what is maybe a little more interesting is actually if we if we normalize this we can look at the comparative shape of the anisotropy spectrum a little more clearly um, and we can see that actually for a, a steeper cosmic ray spectral index assumed for the proto prototype galaxy model the anisotropy signature is actually broader um, and it's sorry is actually steeper uh, or, or conversely it's broader for the case of a shallower spectral index and that seems to be because even for the even when we're accounting for internal, internal attenuation um, what we're seeing is still a larger fraction of gamma rays being emitted from the, the galaxy populations at high energies and this is more sensitive to the cascade process because of its energy dependence uh, which means that the photons are getting cascaded more and what we're seeing is a higher cascade fraction um, a higher cascade fraction in, in that case and therefore a, a broader spectrum index uh, sorry and bear, bear in mind this is uh, a lower energy band which is more sensitive to stuff being cascaded into it rather than stuff cascading out of it um, so actually if we like I, if, if I turn off the, the cascade process in my calculation like these three lines become completely coincident so it, it is it is to do with this cascade process so we could also um, uh, probe the galaxy evolution properties like their redshift distribution and just for a, a, a brief proof of concept um, I could I, I could do a, I do a quick calculation to show what happens if we shift the cosmic star formation history half a redshift unit in one direction or the other direction so a delayed start cosmic star formation or early cosmic star formation of course this is unphysical but I wanted to explore what kind of impacts it has on the on the resulting signature and again, like in, the, in, in this case, like the, the difference that we're seeing is, is basically due to a difference, an unphysical difference due to the, the crude adjustments I made to the, the, the source population model there. Um, so we get more uh, flux with the delayed cosmic star formation history model because from the shape of the function, firstly, uh, we end up with um, slightly more stars being formed in this scenario. Um, and also those stars are less affected by cascades. Um, so that, that star formation, the gamma ray emission that results in less cascades and are less attenuated by, by the, the cascade process. Um, and again, like maybe more interesting is to look at the comparative, uh, the comparative shapes of the spectrum by, by normalizing again. Um, and we can see that in both cases, the, uh, the spectrum becomes a little, a little sharper, sorry, a little broader. Um, and this seems to be to do with the uh, competing effects of both like a, uh, so in the case of like a de delayed cosmic star formation history, um, the competing effects of uh, more stars at lower redshift, uh, sorry, more star formation at lower redshift, but also being combined with less cascade, um, less cascade emission. So I guess my point here is that the, like, if, if star formation, um, if, if populations of galaxies followed rather different uh, redshift distributions, um, or if uh, there were um, different gamma ray sources contributing to the gamma ray sky, for example, AGN versus star forming galaxies, we should expect to see slightly different or maybe even substantially different signatures being imprinted into the gamma ray background anisotropy. Um, so I guess the final point that, that, that should be addressed here is uh, what the, the detection prospects are um, and, and what that means for future theoretical development. So I appreciate what I've shown you so far is, is very much a, a proof of concept uh, preliminary study, uh, just indicating what, what could, be done, could be done by looking at anisotropies. Uh, so in terms of observational prospects, of course, there's two, two great options coming up over the next few years. The first, um, of course, is the ongoing operation of the, the Fermi Lab Space Telescope. As that continues to operate, it's increasing the integration time over the whole sky. And then also there's the upcoming Cherenkov Telescope Array, and, and part of its key science programs will be to observe 25% of the extragalactic sky approximately over a program of three years of observations. Um, and actually, with both of these could yield um, sensitivities sufficient to um, to detect the anisotropy signature over sufficiently large regions of the sky. Uh, so Fermilab, I estimate, could do it with could do it clearly in about ten years, over about ten to fifteen years. 
Um, and already, just in fact, just in 2016, there were hints of detections from different populations um, in the anisotropy signature uh, in Fonasa et al. 2016, which found two, two peaks in that anisotropy spectrum that I showed you um, and attributed one to the LLAX and the other to star forming galaxies. But the signature is not the signal there was not not particularly clear, and I think in in future years it's become a lot clearer and much better, um, much better uh, signal extraction will be possible. Then with CTA, um, this is certainly detectable. In this case, I show the forty to fifty GeV band, and um, if you look at one the time needed to detect sufficient flux or get to a sufficient sen sensitivity in one pointing, we're looking at like but less than less than half an hour or so. Um, and this is easily sufficient over the uh, over the proposed survey region, which would look at each, which would spend about over one hour, one hour and eleven minutes, I think, on each each pointing to um, observe the gamma ray background. So, hopefully, I've, I've convinced you that that this is something that's that's maybe worth looking into, um, and that um, gamma ray sorry gamma ray sources, in particular star forming galaxies, can. Um, in, can introduce anisotropic signatures into the gamma ray background. Uh, but I should say this is very much a first parametric study and it's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we do need to do a lot more theoretical work to be able to extract these signatures correctly. Um, so we need to do more theoretical work firstly to understand physically what detailed, uh, what more de physically detailed models uh, should imprint into the gamma ray background to understand what plausible signatures would look like. And from that, we need to be able to develop bespoke extraction techniques for the expected signatures once we know roughly what they should look like from more, more uh, sophisticated modeling. And then develop appropriate transforms to avoid things like blocking artifacts, avoid things like some, like for example, a lot of the, the results I've shown you so far are relying on that um, assumption that a Fourier transform is, is appropriate, that's not necessarily the case, because it assumes linear, linearity in the signature. Um, and all sorts of other things that really do need to be taken into account before we can realistically start to use true data to um, extract information about star forming galaxies. And I think the time to build up this, this theoretical capability and develop prototype um, data analysis pipelines is, is now, because appropriate data will soon become available. And there's gonna be a lot of potential with this, with this data to start to probe things like the uh, cosmic ray activity in star forming galaxies. So that, that brings me to my last slide. Um, I hope that in the last hour or so I've convinced you that um, uh, firstly gamma ray back gamma ray emission from, from distant unresolved galaxies can make a non-negligible contribution to the gamma ray background. Um, and that these the, the anisotropies in the background could actually reveal, have the potential to reveal, reveal characteristics about cosmic ray activity in those populations of galaxies, uh, potentially re revealing new information about the possible role of cosmic rays in feedback, something that we think now is important, but is not well constrained or, or fully understood at the moment. And this, this will soon be detectable with, with current instruments and next generation studies. Uh, so we need to develop new detailed theoretical efforts to, to carefully and properly model the expected properties of these signatures from various source distributions and populations um, in order to support future signal extraction and interpretation frameworks. Um, so uh, this, the, like a lot of the results I showed you was, uh, has been published in the, this, this paper, which was accepted just a couple of days ago, actually, in Nonting Notices. So if you're interested in more details, um, do, do feel free to check that out and, and have a look at some of the details of the calculations. Um, and of course, I'll be around for the next uh, couple of hours, I think, and also tom tomorrow evening, I, I will uh, be available if, if anyone wants to discuss further. Uh, so apart from that, thank you very much for your, for your attention and for your time. And, and that's everything. Thank you so much, Alice, uh, for your very, very uh, thorough and informative talk. Uh, so, so yes, uh, let's, uh, if anyone have any question, please, uh, the floor is open. Because we are a bit overrun, but I do have uh, one quick question.
question because basically, unless you cover also the question I want to ask about the future like detection. And uh, now it's indeed, I think it's the time to push on the theoretical front. You also mentioned some of the work that needs to be done. Uh, my first question is what, which, which uh, part of it will you continue kind of to, to uh, make me focus on? Because there's definitely like multi fronts to tackle the, the problem, to understand the signatures. So what do you see as the next step for yourself and in the field? <laughs> Yeah, uh, so me personally, um, I think that the next step is to is to get a better understanding of how um, certain. So I, I built this prototype model, but there's increasing suggestions in the literature that a prototype model is not the best description for the gamma ray emission uh, from, from star forming galaxies. And there's been a few approaches. Uh, one just earlier this year, which looked at things. Uh, something they called spectral blending, where they considered a range of different spectral indices for different galaxies and looked at the resulting gamma ray background for that. Um, but there's evidence for like also things like galactic outflows can affect, can affect substantial fractions of, of cosmic rays from their host galaxy, reducing the gamma ray emission by you know up to maybe 50% or so. But the modeling for this is maybe a little complicated to do correctly to correctly assess the cosmic ray flux that should emerge from these kind of systems. Uh, so for me, I want to tackle some of these problems, understand what the, the level of variation is like between uh, different different galaxies, different star forming galaxies and the implications for cosmic ray containment and subsequent gamma ray emissions. So we can start to relax some of these assumptions that have been made in this prototype approach. I see, thanks. And uh, how about magnetic viewers? <laughs> Okay. It's us, yes. <laughs> it's a very, very interesting point and something I didn't touch on at all. So magnetic fields are actually really important um, and can substantially mess up the ability for us to resolve um, gamma ray anisotropy uh, signatures. And the reason is because of this, this cascade process. Not only is a lot of this flux coming from the cascade process, but the cascade process relies on um, the formation of these electron positron pairs. And these can uh, broaden signatures in the gamma ray and I saw it, gamma ray background. Um, so, really, to do to do very thorough modeling, uh, cosmological magnetism really does need to be considered. These intergalactic magnetic fields are are very important, and actually, I would expect from some rough calculations, I would expect these would imprint a signature all by themselves. And this needs also to be understood. Thank you so much, Alice. And does any other uh people want to ask any question, please feel free. And let's thank our speaker again uh, for his wonderful talk. And because it's a bit overrun, so uh, I think I will kind of stop the recording and then leave the floor open. And what, whoever wants to ask uh, any question, please stay around. And thank you so much, Alice, again for your talk. Thank you, thank you very much for the invitation.